So the young people, they'll be dismissed their time, they'll put their, their violators. All right, good morning, church. It's so good to be here this morning. I'll introduce our family again. We are the Deaton family to the country of Switzerland. We're from Hopkinsville, Kentucky. If you're not familiar with Kentucky, it's the most western side of Kentucky. Uh, Hopkinsville is about an hour north of Nashville. We're right on the border of Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, so it is a uh, uh, western side of Kentucky, which my wife grew up in central Kentucky, Somerset. And then I was raised, as the video said, in Pikeville, which is the most eastern tip of Kentucky. Now, I joined the Army to get out of Kentucky, and they put me at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, so that was counterproductive. Uh, however, we did uh, enjoy eastern or western Kentucky so much, we stayed there after we got out of the military. We just loved the area, loved our church. We got plugged into a good church there and started serving, and uh, we were just excited about what the Lord was doing, so we stayed. We just, like I said, we're really blessed by uh, just everything he was doing in our life at that time. Now, as I was telling the, the young kids earlier, I uh, am obviously in my 30s before I surrendered to the mission field, so the Lord had been working on this for a long time. Uh, but the most important thing is that we remain faithful, is it not? When he gives direction, uh, we don't always get all the answers up front. We have to be faithful and patient, and then the Lord will give direction as time comes. Uh, I do want to just say this. Uh, the kids are dismissed. I didn't want to embarrass little Titus, but uh, happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. This morning, when we woke up, uh, little Titus, he's our honest Abe, okay? All of our kids are really honest, but Titus is no nonsense. How old is Titus? Eight. He is eight years old, and he's no nonsense. I doubt he's my kid. I'm a jokester. And, uh, and when we got up this morning, I said, uh, I said, guys, remember today's Mother's Day? And they knew. And I said, Titus, I said, I'm so grateful for, for mom. And he said, yeah, me too. Other kids are eating breakfast. And I said, man, isn't she just perfect? And he said, no. <laughs> I said, oh. I said, okay. I said, I think she's perfect. He goes, I think Jesus is the only perfect one. Oh. And I said, well, you got me there, okay, Titus? Come on, it's Mother's Day. Give her some slack. <laughs> he did agree with me, though. She is very, very, very good, just not perfect. He said Jesus is the only perfect one. But uh, seriously, though, happy Mother's Day to you all. Psalm 127, it's not where we're going to be, but it does say, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb and his reward, air, as arrows are on the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And it's just so exciting to see God working in these children up here singing uh, the special that they had prepared for Mother's Day. It was such an encouragement to me, as I'm sure it was to all you mothers out there. Uh, but I am just so excited to see God working here in this church Amen. with just the arrows that uh, moms and dads are preparing out there. Parents, keep it up. Amen. I know it can be tired. It can be exhausting. It's just a lot of work. Um, but it's worth it all, isn't Amen. it? Amen. Now, if you got your Bibles, we'll be in Mark chapter 8, as where we're going to kind of springboard from, and we'll end up in Luke a little, a little later on. Uh, but as you're turning there, once again, we are the Deaton family. The Lord has blessed us with four kids between the ages of 11 and 6, and uh, we just are excited for the Lord calling us to Switzerland. Now, this morning, we're going to talk about why Switzerland. We're going to start here in Mark chapter 8. And we're going to talk about why Switzerland tonight. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit more about um, the where and the when. Okay, we get a little more specific tonight in the Switzerland uh, calling, but tonight we're going to talk about, or this morning we're going to talk about why Switzerland. And Mark chapter number eight, <clears throat> uh, we're going to start reading in verse number fourteen. Verse number fourteen. Now, I can't see that clock back there. I am blind. <laughs> I was artillery, so not only is my hearing bad, but my vision. I don't know what that has to do with artillery, but uh, I can't see, so I'm going to pull my phone out. Pastor said you guys are normally out here by three, so I'm going to try my best to go that long. Uh, I'm just kidding. We'll be out of here uh, quickly, I promise you. But I like to have fun in church. Uh, it's just, it, it, we take it serious. Don't get me wrong, but I think that 
uh, we, we ought to just enjoy being in the house of the Lord. I think it's fun. It's not a chore. It's not something that's a duty of ours. We should have a desire to come to God's house. And, and I believe that the, in that desire, we can have fun while we're doing it. Uh, so Mark 8, if you're there, chapter number 8, verse number 14, it says, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Now there had they in the, in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. They reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. Verse 17, When Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand, have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not, having ears, hear ye not, and do ye not remember? Church, my question to you tonight, this morning, not tonight, is do you remember? Do you remember? Like the video said in Switzerland, there was a time that uh, the gospel was preached all throughout Switzerland, and it started 500 years ago. And you can see that that flame was quickly put out, um, and they persecuted. Now, when you think of Switzerland, you don't think of persecution. And today, we're in no danger of physical harm in preaching the gospel in Switzerland. But they have went hundreds of years in darkness. Beautiful country. Very beautiful. But folks, does the Bible not teach that physically it doesn't matter as long as spiritually on the inside, if we're not right? We're going to talk this morning about why Switzerland, but more importantly, do you remember? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this day you've given us. Lord, thank you for this morning, allowing us to be here on Mother's Day. Lord, we think about just all the mothers that are represented here this morning. Lord, we pray that you bless them in a very special way. Lord, we do thank you for your word, the truth that it brings. Lord, we thank you for just uh, the opportunity to, to gather as a church. Lord, we do pray that you'll prepare our hearts for the message to come. Lord, we pray that you'll um, uh, be a blessing, Lord, in just your words that are spoken. But Lord, we pray that we can apply them to our lives. Lord, use them in our daily tasks. Heavenly Father, we pray that everything that's said and done, that you'll get the honor and the glory for it. For in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, church, I, I like to ask the question, do you not remember here in verse number 18, what Jesus asked, do you remember the day that you got saved? If not, we are going to talk a little more about that because it is absolutely of vital importance that you know Jesus as your Savior. Amen. If you do remember the day you got saved, was it not a great day? Amen. If you reflect upon that day that somebody shared the gospel with you, it ought to bring joy to you. It ought to just bring a happiness in your heart, a joy unspeakable when somebody shared the gospel with you. Now, do you remember the first day you came to this church? I remember it was yesterday. <laughs> but seriously, when, when we were looking for this church, I would tell my wife I was getting nervous because we were running low on gas. I said, I have not seen a gas station in a long time. And I looked at the population of Satillo, Satillo, and it was like seven. I said, boy, we're in trouble. Such a small town. But do you remember the day you found this new church? Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you just stumbled upon it. Maybe you had family that went here. Maybe you had heard about it in different means. But everybody's here today, and there was a first time you came here. A first time. Do you remember what that feeling was like? When I think about Switzerland, it's been hundreds of years since they remember. Hundreds of years since they've had that feeling of knowing the gospel, of knowing the truth, of having somebody share with them. Hundreds of years before they stepped into a good church, Teaching and preaching like this one, it's been hundreds of years. Do you remember? Now, if we continue on in verse number 19, it says, When I break the five loaves among 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments took he up? And they said unto him, Twelve. And when, they, when the seven among 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took he up? And they said, Seven. And verse number 21, it says, And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? You know, there comes a time where we may not necessarily forget, but here we see that it did slip their memory. They're asking Jesus, how is he going to feed them when they didn't bring any food? Now, in chapter 8 here, by the time we've reached this point, they've watched Jesus perform dozens of miracles already. It will not turn there, but in chapter 1, 
They seen him cast out the evil spirits. They've also seen him heal Peter's mother-in-law miracles. Some of you say, healing my mother-in-law. That's not a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> well, between you and your mother-in-law, okay? But he also healed the sick in chapter 1. In chapter 2, he healed the sick. He also healed the hand in chapter 3. Calm the storm in chapter 5. Cast out demons. I mean, he performed miracle after miracle after miracle. And then we get to this point, and the, di the, the disciples say, Jesus, how are we going to eat? And so when they say this to Jesus, Jesus not only asks them, do you not remember what I've already done for you, and how is it that you don't understand? That's what he's saying. I like to call it the train mentality. Anybody live close to a train? Anybody? So in Hopkinsville, our house was 20 yards off the train tracks. That is close to the train. Not only was it close to the train, our house was an old house, so although sturdy, the windows were the wooden windows, I mean, it was, it was just an old house. You said, why would you buy that house? Because it was cheap, okay? <laughs> when you've got four kids, you have one goal, and that's to survive, all right? <laughs> so we bought this house because it was cheap, and our payment was only 400 and some change. So it was an old house, it was a cheap house, we're a big family, it fit everybody, so we bought the house. Now, when we first bought the house and we moved in, the first three to six months, the train about killed us. Every time it would come through, the whole house would shake. Whole house would shake. We'd have friends over and fellowship, because like I said, we love to have fun. We'd, we'd fellowship weekly, and our friends would say, how do you stand the train? And we'd say, I have no clue. As soon as I can sell this house, we're going to. <laughs> but we didn't. We kept the house, and three to six months would go by, and after about a year of living there, friends would come over, and they'd say, how do you stand the train? We'd say, actually, we're, we're kind of getting used to it. And they'd say, really? We'd say, yeah, we, we, we hardly ever really even notice it anymore. And then after a little more time, the train would come through, and by that time, even though... It still shook the house like it did, even though it would still rattle the walls, even though the termites would still hold hands and pray. <laughs> That's how close we were. They were hoping the house didn't fall down. We'd say, what train? We got to the point to where we didn't even reckon, we didn't realize the train was coming through anymore because we had gotten so used to the train coming through, it just became second nature to us. That's how easy it was. And, and that's a train physically happening. So how did disciples get to this point right here? They developed what I like to call the train mentality. They got so used to watching Jesus do miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, they started to phase it out. Folks, here is my concern with the church today. We're so used to hearing truth after truth after truth, and we have the truth in our very hand, and we hear it so much, we get to the point it's a train to us. We start to block it out. Now imagine 500 years of not having truth. That's where Switzerland's at. 500 years of not hearing the truth, and they have nothing to block out anymore. So I like to ask churches and, 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 and just individuals and Christians, do you remember? Do you remember what it's like? Please don't ever get to the point to where we start treating God's truth like the train. We start treating the truth that we hear all the time, every Sunday, every Wednesday, we treat the truth like it's the train, and we slowly start to block it out. I can promise you the disciples didn't do it on purpose. Here's how it happens. Complacency. Complacency. They got so used to it, it quit being a miracle to them, and it became the norm. <clears throat> Friends, when we come to church... It's not just the norm. When we come to church, we come because we desire to hear God's word. If we continue on in the same chapter, verse number 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and he rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He's telling them of something to come. And verse number 32, and he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Could you imagine arguing with Jesus? That's what Peter did here. Peter took Jesus aside, and he rebuked him. He didn't want to hear the truth of what Jesus was telling him. Now, if we continue reading in verse number, uh, uh, if we continue reading in verse number thirty-three, 
It says, but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus immediately rebuked Peter for not wanting to hear the truth. Church, I'm afraid that we're getting to the point in our societies, in our communities, in our churches, we're getting to the point where we're tired of hearing the truth, almost to the point that we're willing to argue with Jesus like Peter did because we no longer want to hear it. Here's the three questions I have for you this morning. The first one is, has the truth changed? The answer's no. The answer's no. Obviously, the truth hasn't changed. God's word is true, and God's word hasn't changed. So then, has the effectiveness of the truth changed? And the answer is no. God's word is still effective today as it was yesterday. Still effective today as it was 500 years ago, and still as effective today as it's going to be tomorrow. It never gets any stronger. It never gets any weaker. It is at its most effectiveness today. So here's my question, church. What's changed? That's the third question. What's changed? You know what's changed? We have. We've changed. Me and you, we have changed. So what do we do when we change? The video said a while ago, Felix Mann, Mons, born in the 1500s, was drowned in Zurich, Switzerland, in the river, drowned in front of his family because he refused to believe like the Catholic Church, and he decided to have a personal relationship with Jesus, and he said... Many are deceived by vain opinion. You know what's changed? Our opinions. We no longer want truth. We would rather have our own opinion. Now, 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 now church, please, please don't misunderstand. I, I'm not here this morning to discourage you. I'm here to encourage you. My, my, my desire is that you are encouraged in the Lord and not discouraged. So how do we get encouraged? Well, here in verse number 31, Jesus told us of something to come. He tells us about, and, and, and he's talking of the chief scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He says, look, it's coming. The day is coming Well, I will give my life for mankind. Although Peter didn't want to hear it, he tells him of something to come. And that's what we find in Luke 22. If you'll turn there, that's where our main text will be, is in Luke 22. Now, this is what Jesus had warned them of to come. He had told them of this moment. He had warned them. Peter didn't want to hear it. He didn't rebuke him. But Jesus rebuked him in front of all the other disciples so that way they knew of the truth. And here it is in verse number 21. But behold, the hand of him that betrayed me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire amongst themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them of which of them should be accounted the greatest. You see, here in verse number 23, when Jesus told them that, hey, look, somebody's going to betray me, they started off doing the right thing. Who is it, Jesus? Point them out. Show them to us. Who's going to betray you? And then the very next verse, what did they do? They made it about themselves. Not, not only did they want to find who it was going to, they wanted to defend Jesus, but then quickly in the very next verse, pride took over. You know what's changed, church? We've become very prideful. Pride took over. And so they began to inquire amongst themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. There was also a strife among them of which of them should be accounted the greatest. You want to get off track? Make it about you. If, if you want to get off course, take the focus off him and put it on yourself. That's what they did here. They started to argue about who of them is the greatest, and they started to get off track. They started to make it about them. Church, that, that's where we're at today. We now have taken the focus off God, off Jesus, and we put it on ourselves, and that's when we've slowly started to get off track. It says here... <coughs> If you'll skip down to verse number 31. Now, after arguing amongst themselves and, and, and trying to figure out which of them was the greatest, we get to verse number 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. The Lord said, Simon, Simon. 
Now, we know that he was known by Peter. That's what they had called him. But here he calls him Simon. Why does he call him Simon? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. It doesn't give us the reason he, he called him by his name Simon. But I believe it was to get his attention. We see that because of the very next verse, he tells us of something about to come. But I got to imagine Peter being the bold one, Peter being the, the argumentative one, Peter being the one that was just the loudest. I, I got to imagine that Peter was making the most ruckus and Jesus had to get his attention. Moms, if you have to get the attention of your kid and they're not listening, what do you normally say? Well, my mom would say my first and middle name. That's how I knew I was in big trouble. When she said Christopher or Chris, you know, I normally just didn't pay attention. But if I heard Christopher Michael, I would immediately look. I knew I was in trouble. Now, she loved the name Michael so much, she named my next brother Michael. It was very weird. There were two Michaels in the house. But she would use my first and middle name. I'm sure many of you moms and dads do the same thing. If you're trying to get your kids' attention, you say their first and middle name because they're not used to it. So because they're not used to it, it just throws them off and it immediately catches their attention to look at you. And here, I believe that's why Jesus used his name, Simon Simon. He knew that was his old name, but he was no longer used to that name. He was used to being called Peter. He used the name Simon and immediately got his attention. He looks at him and then he says, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Now folks, that's very serious business. If Satan desires to have you, him, Peter, I can promise he desires to have each and every one of us. Mom and Dad, I, I, I just want to caution you that the devil doesn't need your approval to influence your kids. He just needs opportunity. I've never met a Christian mom or dad who would willingly give their, their child over to Satan or the, the wicked ways of this world, but he doesn't need your approval. He just needs opportunity. Little opportunities is what he uses. And here he says, Simon, Simon, Satan, desire, Satan hath desired to have you. He talks about Satan's desire to have him. Why? Because of the trial. To throw him off, I think about desires of Satan. I think about our survey trip when we went to Switzerland. Anybody ever flown in an airplane? Several of us, okay. So, when I think about Satan's desires, I think about how our survey trip when we went to Switzerland. Now, as the video said, there's no missionaries in America from Switzerland. So when we were taking the survey trip, we had really no information to go off of. We had to kind of go into this blindfolded. So when we were taking our survey trip, we really just were, were winging it, okay? Now, on the way to the airport, the, air the airline texted us because I pre-registered our ticket. And the, air company, the airline texted us and said, hey, your flight has been delayed. Oh, you want to talk about a headache. Just a flight delay in general is a headache, but international flight delays are even worse. So my pastor, who's driving me and my wife and, and my pastor and his wife, they say, what would you like to do? We'll put you in a hotel tonight if you'd like, and then you guys can just obviously sleep in Nashville, get up early the next morning, go to the airport. I said, no, I said, I would like to just go there. Just go there. I'd rather go there, get through security, get inside, you know, just be done with it, and we'll stay in the airport the five, six-hour delay. He said, okay, but because of that delay, several other things had to happen. If you flown, you know that if you have a hotel, you have to now change your reservation. So I called the hotel, and I said, hey, listen, our flight has been delayed. We're not going to make it on time, and we're going to have to change our check-in. Is that going to be a problem? They said, oh, yeah, that's going to be a problem. I said, well, why is that going to be a problem? They said, you can't change your, your, your check-in 48 hours prior to checking in. I said, oh, man, what does that mean? They said, well, we're going to have to charge you a $300 fee. I said, for what? They said, because you missed check-in. We had the room for a couple days, but because we didn't check in on time, now we got charged $300 for nothing. So I said, okay, well, there's nothing we can do. They said, no, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do. So then I called the rental car company in Switzerland. And y'all had a couple of people that went to Switzerland. I, I've talked to a few of them. And so at first we were going to get a rental car. So I called the rental car company. I said, hey, instead of landing now at 530, we're going to land at 930 or it was 430 to 930, something like that. I said, is that going to be a problem? And they said, oh, yeah, big problem. I said, why is that a problem? They said, because we close at 9. I said, oh, yeah, that's a problem. 
And they said, uh, but if you'd like, you can take advantage of our after hours program. I said, well, why didn't you start with that? Here you got me in a panic. They said, yeah, no problem. That's where you sleep in the airport after hours until we open the next morning. I said, that's not a real after hours program. They said, well, that's the only thing we offer. I said, well, no, we would rather just get a room local and get our car the next morning. So they said, okay, well, suit you, whatever you want to do. So we get to the airport, and now our check-in's going to get delayed. We've got to pay extra money. Our rental car, they're not going to be there when we land. Now we've got to get a hotel locally. Now I'm paying for two nights, one at a hotel that I can't even stay in, and the other one at a hotel next to the airport because our other hotel was two hours away by car. We would have never made it in time to check in and then have to train back to the airport the next day. It was just too big of a headache. So we just go ahead and decide that we'll get an airport next to the hotel. So we go through security at Nashville Airport, and when we go through security, we, they check all our baggage and luggage and things like that, and then the lady says, so what brings y'all overseas today? And I was thinking in my head, there's two things you don't say in an airport. One is bomb, right? Don't say that word in the airport, okay? Here's the second one, and I said it. I meant to say we're tourists, but instead I said we're terrorist. <laughs> and when I said that, the lady's eyes got this big. I said, no, 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 we're not terrorists. I meant tourists, okay? I, please don't call the cops. And now her eyes are even bigger. And I'm like, no, listen, ma'am, I promise we're not terrorists. And every time I say it, everybody's like, stop saying the word. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I, I told her, I was like, I'm so sorry. I promise we're missionaries to Switzerland. Now, when the world thinks of missionaries, you know what they think? Starving kids in Africa, orphanages in, in, in Peru, right? They don't think of a place like Switzerland. But we know the gospel's needed all over the world, right? So I'm trying to explain to her that we're missionaries to Switzerland, and I'm not a terrorist. Please don't call the cops. And so after about 15 minutes, that's how I ended up with my first felony. I'm just kidding. I didn't get a felony. I'm just kidding. But she actually did let us through, and we didn't get in any more trouble. So that was a relief. So then we get on the airplane, and now we've, this is after six, seven hours that we waited in the airport. Now we get on the airplane, and we fly across the big ocean, right? My wife had never been on a plane to this point. Never. This is her first flight, and now it's international. I had been on Army airplanes and helicopters dozens and dozens of times, so at this point, I had no regard for my life. I didn't care, you know. <laughs> and those, those helicopters, if you know anything about them, they're shady at best. So we, we fly across the street. We connect into another plane. And when we get on the plane, it's hot. It's just muggy. And, and we're like, wow, this one's just, this one's horrible. It's way worse than the last one. Well, that's because the pilot then gets on the intercom. And he goes, hey, folks, I just want to let you know the left engine isn't working. <laughs> and we're like, oh, man, another flight delay. But then he says, no, no, I just want to let y'all know that we're going to go ahead and take off anyways. <laughs> My wife's never been on a plane. And he goes, rest assured, this is the newest, nicest plane we have, and we're going to have an engineer look at it real quick. If he can't fix it, we've already talked to the tower control. They said we can make it to the next destination on one engine. Now, folks, I know you didn't plan to come to do math this morning, but if you're in the air with two engines and one goes bad, how many you have left? One engine, right? If you're in the air with one engine, because the other one's already bad and it goes bad, how many of you have left? No engines. So we're sitting there looking at each other like, is this guy serious? And yeah, after about 10 minutes, we were in the air with a broke engine. It just blew my mind. I thought the whole time, man, Satan's desires to discourage us is so strong. Was it not? To discourage us in the airport with the mix-up of words, to discourage us with the hotel, to discourage us with the rental car, to discourage us with the flight. And then, folks, after we got there, I'm telling you, come back tonight, okay? You're going to hear about how we got robbed in Switzerland. And, and, and time and time again, Satan's desire was to discourage every step of the way. Why did he want to do that? Because if he desired to discourage Peter... My friend, he desires to discourage us. He doesn't want the truth to get to Switzerland. He doesn't want the truth to get past those front doors. And he'll do anything and everything to discourage us every step of the way. So the Bible says, 
Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. Isn't that so encouraging? Amen. To know that the Heavenly Father is praying for us. Romans 8, turn it real quick. Romans chapter 8. 34, while you're turning there, I'll read. Romans 8, 34, it says, Who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again? Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? We can add, or discouragement, or Satan, or our plans not panning out, or our failures, our pride, our ever-besetting sin, what shall separate us? And it says in verse number 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Church, that's where we're getting off track. Are we still persuaded to this day? Are we still convinced? Are we still sure that no matter what, like verse number 39, it says, Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus is petitioning for me and for you to the Father constantly. Just like he did for Peter in Luke 20. If you turn back, he says, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go. You see, Jesus was trying to warn him of the trial ahead. He was trying to warn him, hey, look, Satan's desires are going to be strong. Hey, hard times are coming, Peter. And when trials come, they do one of three things. They derail us, and they get us off track. They distract us. From the goal, but every time for everybody, they always define us. Do they not? They always define us. When a trial comes, you may not get distracted. When a trial comes, you may not get derailed, but I can promise you, friend, when a trial comes, it is going to define you. Are you going to remain strong through the trial, or are you going to stumble? If I ask each and everybody in this room, what was Peter known for? Generally, the room is split into two, two things. Either he's known for his great faith in walking on water, or he's known for what's getting ready to come. His denial of Jesus. That's the two things Peter's known for. Why? Because that was the two trials he faced, and they defined him. We see he says, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death, you see, in verse number 33, he called him Lord. He acknowledges his Christ head. He says, I am ready to go. That was his character. It was strong. His courage said both into prison and to death. Why? Because he was around the right crowd. He was around his brothers and sisters in Christ. He was around the right people who made him feel the right way. And then he proved it in verse number 50. He said, and one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, suffer you thus far. And he touched his ear and it healed him. You see, here we see that Peter was not only willing to do what he had said, but then he executed it. He proved it with action. He cut off the ear. Now, that's not what we remember Peter for. When I asked initially, that's going to be our two responses because what comes is what defines Peter. Let's keep reading. Skip down for time's sake to verse number 54. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. Here's where we start to get off track. We follow afar off. We start to put distance between us and the heavenly Father. That's what Peter did. He started to put distance between him and Jesus. My friend, don't Stray away even a little distance. And Peter followed afar off. We see first his condition here started to disintegrate. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Now his crowd has changed. 
He's no longer with his brothers and sisters in Christ, being encouraged and strengthened in the Lord. Now his crowd has changed, and now he's with the crowd that wanted to crucify Jesus. He sat down among them. Why? Because he strayed away. Verse number 56, But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire, and urged he looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. Verse number 57, And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. The first time he denied Jesus. Why? Because his courage was disarmed. A few verses ago, his courage was willing to take him to death in prison, but now his courage has been disarmed, and he's now denying the very Christ he was willing to die for. His courage disarmed. Verse number 58, and after a, what's that say? A little while. Just give it some more time. Just give it a little more time. Not long. Just a little while. Another saw him. And said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not the second denial. And verse number 59, about the space of one hour, after another confident firm saying, Of a truth, this fellow is also with him, for he is a Galilean. Church, don't miss it. Verse number 59, just one hour. A little time. Just a little more time passed by without being close to the Savior. And what happens? He denies him a third time. Verse number 60, And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he had spake, the cock crew. His conversation distressed. Verse number 61, The Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered. Church, remember I asked you in the beginning, do you remember? Do you remember? Here's what happens when we start to forget. We get to where Peter's at. Here's what happens when we start to put it in the back of our mind, our salvation, the joy it brings, the church we're a part of. Here's what happens when we start to get away from those things. We start to get off track. It says here that there came a time when Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And verse number 62 said, Peter went out and wept bitterly. He went out and wept bitterly. Why? Because his character destroyed, his conscience damaged, his composure dejected. This is what we remember Peter for. The trial defined him. Friends, if this is where it ended, it would be a very sad story. But this isn't where it ended for Peter. We often forget what happens after this. You see, Peter went out and wept bitterly, his heart broken for what he had done and friends, if he would have stayed away from the Savior, it would have been a very sad story. But there comes a time when Peter comes back. He comes back to the Father. He never gets far enough away to where he doesn't see him. He never gets too far where God doesn't love him. There comes a time when Peter comes back. Friends, it's not too late. We can always come back. Mark 16, 7. Mark 16, 7. Let's turn there real quick. Mark 16, 7. All right, let's, let's go to verse number 6. Let's start in verse number 6. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Verse 7 says, But go your way, tell his disciples, and who's it say? Peter. Peter. Why does it name Peter by heart? Name. Why does it name Peter by name? Because the last we had known of Peter before this, he left brokenhearted. Peter thought that he had denied Jesus, which in turn would have disqualified him from God's love. He thought that he was too far gone. But here he says, hey, tell his disciples, but don't forget Peter. Tell Peter. Peter needs the encouragement. Peter, make sure he knows. My friends, he wanted to encourage Peter. How often does God encourage us, but we overlook it? Don't overlook God's encouragement, no matter how big or small. Here he wants to encourage Peter. He says, hey, tell my disciples, don't forget about Peter. The other ones would have known that Peter had denied him. Therefore, if it was me or you, we would have never told Peter because of what he did to our Savior. But no, he says, hey, don't forget to encourage Peter. Tell him. Tell him I love him. Tell Peter. He's still a disciple. So let's keep reading the story. Turn back to, to, to Luke. Let's 
Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, John. I said Luke. Turn to John chapter 20. He wants to encourage Peter. He wants to tell Peter that, hey, tell him I love him. Make sure Peter knows he's still in the family. So we see the next thing that happens. They tell Peter, verse number four is where we'll start. <clears throat> or verse number three in John 20. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. Now, I want to pause here because it's important to note that, yes, Peter got outran. Why did Peter lose the race? The Bible doesn't tell us if he was slower. He, he probably just wasn't a good runner. I can promise you, if anybody in here races me, I'm going to lose, okay? <laughs> this is not a runner's body. Why did Peter lose the race? What, was he physically slower? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Did he lose the race because maybe he hesitated? Maybe he knew that if he made it to the sepulcher and it was in fact empty, then that means that he surely denied the Son of God. Did he hesitate? Now, friends, who in here is hesitating this morning? Who in here is afraid to come running back to the Savior, and you're not giving it your all because of something you've done? Here, Peter lost the race. But the important thing was, he still came back. He came back. Verse number 5, And stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Verse 6, Then come in Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Verse number 8, But went in also that other disciple, which came first to the, sep to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. So we know John, when he saw the empty tomb, he believed. So the Bible tells us. What did Peter do when he saw the empty tomb? doesn't tell us here, but we do get an answer. We have to look at Luke 24. Turn there real quick. I'm almost done, okay? I promise. Do you know the greatest lie I was told by preachers? I'm almost done, okay? We just keep going, right? Keep going, keep going. We're almost at the end, okay? P Peter doesn't tell us, it doesn't tell us what Peter believed when he saw the empty tomb until we get to Luke 24. Uh, for time's sake, look at verse number 11. And their words, their words seemed to, or their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, same story we just read, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes lined by themselves and departed, what's it say? Wondering. One left believing, one left wondering in himself that which was come to pass. My friends, there's two people in here today. Some of you are going to leave this morning, many of you are going to leave this morning believing what Jesus has done, and you've accepted him. But friends, if there's one in here this morning, don't leave wondering. Leave knowing for sure the truth in which the Bible teaches how you too can get to heaven. One left believing, one left wondering. Here's what I'm wondering. How long is it going to take us to get to Switzerland? To teach them God's love. How, how long, how much longer are they going to have to sit in darkness, uh, uh, under the spiritual darkness, although beautiful, spiritually, they're starving. That's what I'm wondering. When we were over there, I had the opportunity to meet a gentleman who was in the Swiss Army. I was telling the kids this in class. We, every, every male has to join the Army in Switzerland. When you're 18, you have to join the Army. Um, now, you'll learn a little more facts about Switzerland because over there they have a religious tax, one of the only countries in the world that requires their, their citizens to pay tax. So that's how come Switzerland's a very tough country to reach, and we're going to talk more about that tonight because in their eyes, their health care is number one, their finances are number one, they're voted number one country to live in. I mean, their economy's booming, it's the greatest in the world. Their dollar, which is the front, is worth more than us to them. They pay a religious tax. They say, why do I need God? I've got everything. They see it as they're already a Christian. They say, I pay my religious tax. Friend, your tithe doesn't make you a Christian. We know that. Your coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. We know that. 
No matter how good life is for you, that doesn't make you a Christian. We know that. They don't. So this, this gentleman was telling me this is his job, okay? He, he's in the Army, but they also have a secular job, a secondary job, because you can either do active service or you can do active mixed with, like, uh, reserve, what we do here in America. So he did that, did active, then it's mixed with reserve. So he said, my job now is to do military on, on his one time a month. He goes, but then, he goes, my job is to identify the homeless population. And I said, really? I said, there's homeless in Switzerland. He goes, oh, yes, there's homeless in Switzerland. I said, I would have never thought that. Because they give you free health care. If you're not for us, we have to pay for it. But if you're a citizen, you get free health care. And, I mean, there's just several perks to living in Switzerland because of the way they have it set up. I said, so, so you all have a homeless population? He said, oh, yeah, brother, we have a homeless population. He goes, and my job is to identify them. Because us in Switzerland, we are so prideful he said that we won't admit if we need help. I said, really? He goes, no, no, absolutely not. He said, if we ever get to the point that we run out of money, he goes, my job is to find them before they die. I said, before they die? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, they will literally recluse themselves from society. They won't admit to their family they need help. They won't admit to anybody that they've ran out of money. He goes, they will recluse themselves, and they will starve to death. He goes, and we'll find them dead in the alleys. We'll find them dead in the woods. We'll find them dead in their apartment. We'll find them dead in their house. We'll find them dead anywhere because they will recluse themselves and they will physically starve to death before they admit they need help. Now, friends, I, I can't tell you what starving looks like, but I can tell you it is a very physically enduring process, very hard on yourself. And if they're willing to go to that far physically before they admit they need help spiritually, how far will they go? Spiritually, how far will they starve themselves before they're willing that they need help? It's going to be a long, tough road. And here it says, Peter left wondering. That's what I'm wondering. When are we going to be able to tell them that God loves them? Wondering. Further in this chapter, verse number 34, it says, Saying the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. The Lord comes back to Simon after his resurrection. comes back to Simon and appeared to him. We don't know what this conversation was about. We don't know what happened, but we do know what the result of this was. And from this point on, Peter never wondered. He never doubted. He never turned back. From this point forward, Peter only preached the name of Jesus boldly. We find that in Acts 2. Here's what we're done. Acts 2. Acts 2, verse number 36 says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent. From that moment on, Peter preached repentance to Jesus because he knew after everything he had done, Jesus was still willing to love him, to come to him, to accept him where he was. Peter said, listen, I don't know how far you've gotten off track, but I'm here to tell you all you have to do is come back. You're never too far. He says, tell them, repent. That's all you have to do. Turn and come back to the Father and he is waiting for you. Now, now, now Bible's closed, okay? My Bible's closed. I'm, we're not turning anywhere else. We're done. Here's what I want to leave you with. Peter told him, come back. Come back. When we were trying to figure out where the Lord wanted us, and we're going to talk more about this tonight, so I don't want to get into it too much, but when we surrendered to the mission field, we didn't have all the answers, okay? We just knew God wanted to use us. And, and, and it started the process of us figuring out where we wanted to go. Where we wanted the Lord to use us. And I called missionary after missionary and, and emailed and WhatsApped and texted. And I, and I did every form of communication I could to reach all these different missionaries. The first country that we were praying about, I reached out to those missionaries and they all said the same thing. Brother, we need help. We need help. Come help us. Come here. And I said, okay, yeah, we'll definitely pray about it. Because we just wanted to be used where the biggest need was. 
That's all we want to do. Fill the biggest gap. So then I called the second country. The missionaries in it, around it, anybody that had anything to do with it. And they had the same answer. Brother, we need help. Come help us. Come here. We, we need help. So then I started to feel guilty. Because now I had to pick who gets to hear the gospel and who don't. Now that's not fair, okay? That's not fair. Because we know it's God's desire that everyone hears. So then I got to the country of Switzerland. There were no missionaries there from any call. Nobody from any contact. I did talk to a gentleman who's in a, a, a bordering country, and he started the conversation off like no other missionary did. Now, I do believe these other missionaries believe this, but this is how he started the conversation off. He said, listen, brother, whatever we're about to talk about or whatever I'm about to say, listen to God more than you listen to me. He said, I want to help you, and I want to encourage you, but my friend, my goal is not to discourage you. Listen to God more than you listen to me. And when he told me that and we talked, that's when the Lord solidified. The biggest need was in Switzerland. Here's what I ask you this morning before we open it up for invitation. Are you listening to God this morning? Are you listening to God? Do you think you've gone too far astray that you can't come back? God says to come. To come, and he's there waiting. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth it brings. Lord, we thank you for what it means. Lord, we do pray that you'll just help us to apply this to our lives. Lord, we pray that we can just, Lord, draw closer to you. Lord, you teach us in your word that it's true, that your word is true. We, we know that your desire for us is to know you more, Lord, for our relationship to grow. Lord, we pray that that's done here this morning. Lord, we pray that, Heavenly Father, your, your word that's been preached will penetrate deep into our hearts. Lord, we pray that, Heavenly Father, we'll draw nigh unto you and you'll draw nigh unto us. Lord, we pray for that one that has gone astray this morning. Lord, we pray that, Heavenly Father, they, uh, that they'll come back. Lord, that they won't be embarrassed. Lord, that they won't be discouraged. Lord, that if anything, they're encouraged, Lord, that you're there waiting with open arms to accept them back. Lord, we do pray that, Heavenly Father, for the one here this morning that don't know you as their Savior, Lord, I don't know. You know the hearts. I don't. But, Lord, if there's somebody in here today, Lord, they're not a part of the believing crowd, but they're a part of the wondering crowd, Lord, I pray that today will be the day that they leave believing and not wondering. Lord, we pray for those that know you, Lord, that have just gone a little off track. Lord, maybe they just... Or just with time, or, or jobs, or just trials. Lord, it's just discouraged them, it's distracted them, it's derailed them. But Lord, we pray that when it defines them, it will be because they're great faith and not unbelief. Lord, we do love you this morning. We thank you for this time to be here. Lord, I thank you for this good church who's allowed us to come and preach your word. Lord, I pray that, Heavenly Father, you'll get us to Switzerland quickly, or that we may reach the lost souls there. In Jesus' name we pray.